Well, good morning and welcome to our online worship for the Sunfield and Greenwood United Methodist Churches in Southern Illinois. I'm Pastor Bill Wiggs, and we're very glad you've joined us for this service of worship on this third Sunday of the great 50 days of Easter. Any other voices you hear in the room are my family, and uh, so glad that they are able to be here with us. Also today, I want to let you know that at the end of the service, we will be having a time of prayer. And so if you have a prayer request that you would like to lift up, I encourage you to either send me on my personal Facebook Messenger a message for that, or to comment it under this live stream so that we will be able to have those prayer requests and those of you who have my phone number are welcome to text me as well so that we can have those at the end of the service. If you have a prayer request that you do not want mentioned online, just note that in your message to us, uh, either on my personal messenger or texting me, and that way we'll be able to pray for the need without mentioning the name. So I encourage you in that. Also, uh, if you are a member of the Sunfield Church, uh, please be uh, willing to give as the Lord leads you, and you can send your tithes to Doug Bishop or to the church address, and we'll make sure that they get there. Also, if you're a member of the Greenwood Church, you can send your tithes and offerings to Dwight Hitt. So I encourage you in that today. Well, let us begin to worship the Lord this morning. Receive this call to worship. Come, let us celebrate the triumph of life over death. This is the good news of Jesus, our risen Savior. He has ransomed us from our futility. Our salvation wasn't purchased with gold or silver or with perishable earthly goods, but with the precious blood of Christ himself. In his resurrection, we are born anew with him, born into a living hope. May we be filled with all the good gifts of your Holy Spirit, that we may share his love with boldness and power, with passion and conviction. Come, let us worship the Lord. We're going to start out our worship service this morning by singing, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. We're going to sing the first, third, fifth, and seventh verses, because Charles Wesley wrote about 18 of those things. And uh, that is found, if you have your hymnals there at home, on page 57 of the United Methodist Hymnal. It's always been the very first hymn in our United Methodist Hymnals. The reason it's number 57 is because there's all kinds of service stuff before that. All right, so verses 1, 3, 5, and 7. Let's sing together. <clears throat> oh, for a thousand. I can, wait a minute, I gotta get a drink. My voice is completely gone here without a drink. Sorry about that. All right, let's try that again. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumph of His grace. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. He speaks and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. The mournful broken hearts rejoice, the humble poor believe. In Christ your head you then shall know, shall feel your sins forgive. Anticipate your heavenly love, and know that love is hell. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this day. We ask, Lord, that as we enter in this time of worship, that you will be glorified. That, Lord, we will experience your love and your presence today. And, Lord, in all things, we may know that you are with us. May your Holy Spirit inspire our worship today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, it's time for our children's sermon. And I have to put on a special thing here this morning here. I figure, you know, everyone should always wear a smile. So I'm going to put on my mask. You'll see why in a minute. 
if I can get it on, that is. There we go. And I got to get my hat. There we go. Now, we have a very special person for our children's sermon this morning. This is my granddaughter, Elizabeth Grace. Can you see her there? Isn't she pretty? Yeah. So we're glad to have her here. Hi there, Elizabeth. So we have a new person to be in our children's sermon today. And uh, I want to tell you today about uh, the fact that we are supposed to tell others about Jesus. But to do that, I want you, oh my, that's mine. Turn off that sound. There we are. I want to show you something here. Uh, hopefully you can see this at home. And kids, you may need to move closer so you can see it better. But uh, I have some dominoes set up here. Now, for a long time, I had no idea that there was actually a game to dominoes other than knocking them all down. But uh, I've played it a few times. Maybe you have too. And uh, you know how this goes, though. I, in fact, I know some of you do because I've seen the videos from your houses of you knocking down a whole bunch of these things. So what I'm going to do, see, we, in order to do this, see all these are lined up in a row. On your screen, it may look like there's one, but there's a whole bunch of them. Here we go. You ready? If I touch one, they're all going to go. And right off the table on the end. She's dawdling around a bit, isn't she? Yeah. So the reason that they did that is because one touched another, touched another, touched another, all down the line until all of them were knocked down. And that's the way it works with telling others about Jesus. Our, our home church, St. Matthew in Belleville, actually had a program one year they called Each One Reach One. It was the idea that as we tell others about Jesus, we tell another person they believe in Jesus, and then another person believes in Jesus, and so on and so forth. So they just keep believing. And that's really the way that the good news about Jesus, his resurrection power, his love, has been spread since the very beginning. One person telling another person and another person until so many people believe in Jesus Christ. That is wonderful good news, isn't it? And so I encourage you kids, I know right now you're not seeing a whole lot of people, but you do see a few. Tell them about Jesus. When you finally get to go back to school, hopefully in the fall, you tell them about Jesus. If you're there and, and you're messing with your mom and dad's Facebook, and I know some of you are still on their phones and you're doing it. I've seen it where you've done it. Tell people about Jesus. And that way, one by one by one, many more will know about him. That's the good news. Isn't that right, Elizabeth? She doesn't seem to care right now, but she will someday. All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that we can tell others about Jesus. And in telling others about Jesus, the church grows. We ask, Lord, that we would each do our part in letting the world know that we have a Savior who is Christ the Lord. For we pray it all in Jesus' name. And all the kids say with me out there, Amen. Amen. All right. We have some big kids say it too today. All right. Elizabeth's going to go back to Grandma. Got her? Sure, you may do All right. We'll, we'll give everybody a little bit closer look. There she is. She used to Isn't she girl. beautiful? Not, okay, that, not that I'm biased at all. Not that I'm biased at all. This is uh, Elizabeth's very first Sunday in church, and we're thankful for that. All right, we're going to be singing uh, another song now, and this is a favorite of an awful lot of people down through the years, uh, In the Garden. It's number 314 in our United Methodist Hymnals, if you have one of those. And we're going to be singing all three verses. <clears throat> all right, you ready? I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear. 
the Son of God discloses, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other And the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing. And the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. And he walks with me and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be fall. But he bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling. And he walks with me and he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. I just love that song. What a beautiful hymn of our faith this morning. Well, today we are coming to the 16th sermon in our series, The Life and Times of Jesus, Our Savior. And if you'd like to listen to any of the other sermons in this series, I invite you to go to the Sunfield United Methodist Church website and listen to them there. The Sunfield website is www.sunfieldumc.com. For sermons preached after March 15th, you can go to the Sunfield YouTube page, or here on Facebook, as it is somewhere down on the page, and you can listen to them there. Today we're reading from the Gospel according to John, chapter 20, verses 11 through 18, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Hear now the word of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been laying. Dear woman, why are you crying, the angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying, Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But we, but go, find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave them his message. This is the word of, the God, for, of God for his people today. Let us rejoice and be thankful in all the Lord has done, is doing, and will do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, open our hearts and minds by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that having heard your words today, our hearts will be encouraged to live more fully for you. And now may the words of my mouth and meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, our rock 
and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, as we come to the living word of God today, we enter into Mary Magdalene's life-changing encounter with the risen Lord. All the events in the life and times of Jesus our Savior that we've looked at really are pointing to this all-important event in the life of Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is, in fact, the most significant event in all of the Gospels and in human history itself. Without the resurrection, we are totally lost. We need the resurrection. It's absolutely the primary important thing in the gospel of Jesus Christ. For without it, we're without hope. In fact, I don't even think we would know about Jesus. We wouldn't know about his miraculous birth or any of his teachings or anything else had it not been for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so as we come to this, we find that we have a very special and life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ that Mary experiences. It's going to change everything about her from then on. Her whole life will change. But before we get to Mary's post-resurrection encounter with Jesus, I'd like to give you just a, a little bit of background information on Mary Magdalene. Uh, the name Magdalene likely indicates that she came from the city of Magdala, a city on the southwest coast of the Sea of Galilee. Luke 8.2 and Mark 16.9 tell us that Jesus cast seven demons out of her. And from then on, she became one of his faithful followers. Think about that. Seven demons. This poor woman was severely bound by the devil. The scripture also says that he healed her of sicknesses. So he completely set her free. Now, in the 6th century, Pope Gregory, the one who brought to light the, the seven deadly sins into our common understanding of the church, he began to identify Mary Magdalene with the sinful woman who washed Jesus' feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. He also associated her with a woman caught in adultery whom Jesus saved from stoning. And the church down through the ages has therefore thought of Mary Magdalene as a reformed prostitute. Now, while the Bible does not say that Mary Magdalene was indeed the one who was talked about in both of those stories, there's some circumstantial outside evidence that points to this understanding, at least we understand where they got it. First of all, the city of Magdala is said to have had a reputation for prostitution. It was uh, kind of the city, you know, the original Sin City kind of place. Now, secondly, the first time Mary Magdalene is mentioned by Luke, it is immediately following the account of the sinful woman there in Luke 7, 36 to 50. And it's because of this that she was labeled as a prostitute by the church. Still, the Bible's not clear when it comes to this. But what we do know for sure is that Mary Magdalene had been set free. We know that absolutely for sure, that the demons had been cast out of her by Jesus. We didn't get to see that episode in her life. We just hear about it later. That kind of freedom meant a whole new life for her, and it explains her extreme devotion to the Lord as seen in the fact that she followed him all the way to the cross. She became a witness to the reality of his physical death. But her devotion didn't stop there. Mary Magdalene, along with some of the other women, followed Jesus' body all the way to the tomb and even came back to finish the Jewish burial rite after the restrictions of the Sabbath were over. We know all about restrictions, don't we? Now, with today's gospel lesson, we are returning to Easter Sunday morning outside of the tomb of our risen Lord. As the women bring spices very early in the morning before the heat of the day would make their task more unpleasant. On Friday, Jesus' body was left on the burial preparation bench in the receiving room of the tomb chamber. They did what they were able to do before it was time to go home for the Sabbath. 
No doubt the women thought they could return following the Sabbath, roll back the stone, and complete the burial, sliding Jesus' body into one of the tomb's burial niches. This would be their final act of devotion to the one they thought was the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Tombs with rolling stones were meant to be opened and closed. Uh, there's been all kinds of stuff that, that has said, you know, well, you know, that tombstone would have been so heavy it couldn't have possibly been moved. And that's not exactly true. The wheel-shaped stone door rolled on a stone track for access as other family members needed to be buried there over the years. It was heavy enough it would have taken several strong men to do it, but nonetheless, the stone could be rolled away for this purpose. The other Gospels record the women's anxiety about who will assist them in moving the heavy stone because they couldn't do it by themselves. But Mary's discovery that the tomb door has been rolled to one side suggests immediately to her that someone has entered the tomb. She doesn't know who at this point. She just knows someone's been there. And perhaps someone came that night or was in the tomb at that very moment. Then Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us that the women stepped inside, and there they encountered an angel with good news <clears throat> that Jesus is risen. Now, Mary's confused and upset, not understanding the message of the angels, because her experience tells her that the message is just too good to be true. I mean, think about it. She was at the cross. She saw him be crucified. She was probably there during a lot of the trial period. She saw all that happened to Jesus. She had walked to the tomb where he was laid, and she saw that big stone rolled in place. She knew beyond a shadow of any doubt that Jesus was dead, period. There's no question there. And so when she arrives at the tomb, it says the women went in. It says that Mary Magdalene didn't even go all the way in. She just kind of leaned in. And I don't know that I would have wanted to go all the way in either. But she's leaning in as the other women rush in. And that's when she sees the angels. That's when they talk. That's when they deal with it. That Jesus is risen. Now, she's confused. You can't blame her. Imagine the despair and loss that she felt. If you have ever lost someone really important to you, then you understand how she feels. Her life before Jesus was really a living hell. It, there's no other way to describe it. Seven demons infesting her life? You can't describe it any other way. That nightmare has been gone. But could it come back? Could it come back with the absence of the one who delivered her? What was she to do? After all, I'm relatively sure that most who are listening to this sermon today, well, you probably haven't been possessed by seven demons and got those cast out of you. At least I hope not. If so, praise God, they were cast out. If someone's listening who's still dealing with that, there is deliverance in Jesus' name, believe me. But just because you have not had that kind of pain does not mean that the pain that you personally have experienced is any less real to you than the pain that she had. Hers is just different. Everybody goes through stuff. Everybody goes through grief. Everybody experiences the pain of loss in one way or another. And so we can relate to the fact that even when she hears the news, she finds it hard to believe. I understand it. The truth is we all go through pain, and it would be difficult for any of us to understand that. In fact, many times when terrible things have happened to us, it's very difficult to hear good news. There are many in our world today who are having trouble hearing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ because of the pain that they have experienced, the rejection they've experienced, the trouble in their life. They say, well, all that is just pie in the sky because no one understands my life. Maybe that's you. Maybe someone listening to this today is going through some stuff that it's hard to hear the good news that their faith is becoming weak because of. Well, you're in good company. Because here we are, 
outside of the tomb with Mary as she is standing there weeping, crying, mourning. She's so frustrated. You know, when my wife gets frustrated, she cries too. Mm -hmm. That's part of what's going on here. It's frustration. It's grief. It's loss. It's bewilderment. And she's crying. And even and after hearing the message, she continues to cry. We see this in the other Gospels. Mary's deepest grief will only be dealt with when she has a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. That's the only way. And since she has only stooped to look in the tomb, she hears someone approaching from behind and suddenly meets a man whom she concludes must be the gardener. After all, the tomb is in a garden. There's got to be a caretaker for it, right? And he repeats the words that the angel said, Woman, why are you crying? But then deflects the question to something so much more important than that. Who is it you're looking for? Think about that. Here Jesus is standing there. He first asks about her emotional health. Hey, why are you crying? And now he just moves her right on from that. It's time to move from the crying to the reality. Who are you looking for? The truth is, she was looking for Jesus. Oh, she didn't expect to see Jesus the way she would in just a moment. But she was looking for Jesus. She was looking for someone to relieve the pain that she was experiencing. And that's often how we are. There's times that we just need to talk to somebody and tell them our story, tell them the kind of pain that we are dealing with. We don't really need an answer, but we need someone to listen. And so she talks to the gardener. She talks to him, and she tries to understand where Jesus is. We're a lot like that. All too often, we have our minds on our problems instead of on the God who has the solutions. Mm -hmm. See, Jesus was right in front of her, and she couldn't get it because her mind was on her problems, we focus on the, the little details of our problems. We allow them to steal our joy, to cloud our judgment, and to blind us from the work and presence of Jesus in our lives. Don't tell me you don't, because I'm sure you're not that different than I am. There's times that I allow all of the trouble around me to cloud my vision of what Jesus has for me, what he's doing for me, and even what he's done for me. With Jesus' second question, he tries to point her away from the problem to something more meaningful. Who are you looking for? The reality of her need for a personal encounter of Jesus is all that matters. He's the solution to her deepest pain. He's the solution to her deepest fears. The tomb is now history. It can be disregarded, and only the living Jesus matters. What she is looking for is freedom from pain and fear and hopelessness. That has characterized her life. It characterized her life before Jesus, and now she's there again. And she wants freedom. It's not until Jesus calls her by name that she begins to understand that she's not been abandoned by her Lord. When Jesus calls Mary by name, the resurrection becomes real to her. She recognizes him for who he is. He is her Rabboni, her teacher, her Lord, the Messiah, the one who saved her from the pain of her demon possession. It took Jesus calling her by name for true freedom to come. Now her joy is restored, and the problems of her past and her present no longer matter at all. Because the one who formed her in her mother's womb and the one who created her anew when he released her from that living hell loves her enough to go out of his way to make sure she knows that she matters to him and that he has done all this for her. Did you know that God knows your name? I think for some of us that's a little bit hard to understand. God knows our names. The Bible says he even knows the number of hairs on our heads, and that changes all the time. 
Go brush your hair. You'll find out. But he does. He knows our name. That's what the Bible tells us. He knows our names, and when we need him, he will call to us and renew our joy. In Isaiah 43, 1, God says to Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. I've called you by name. You are mine. Isn't that a wonderful statement mm -hmm. from God? The Bible is God's love letter to us, and those same words God spoke to Israel he speaks to each and every one of us this very day. At times, it's hard for us to understand that the God of the universe cares enough to know our names. After all, it's hard for most of us to remember the names of people we see on a regular basis. I mean, think about it. How does it feel when someone calls you by name? Doesn't it make you feel special when people know your name? Yes. It brings great satisfaction when someone that we may have only briefly met, remembers our name. I'll never forget the impact that it made on our children, Sarah and Joshua, when one of our former bishops, Bishop Christopher, called them by name. And they weren't even wearing name tags, but she knew who they were. How many kids do you think the pastors of this conference have? But she knew who they were. She knew their name. She called them by name. And that made a tremendous impact on them. The bishop that they had for 12 years knew them personally. That's a powerful thing, isn't it? Think about it. How does it feel for you when someone cares enough to know your name? Now, many times I've been embarrassed when the name of a person I'm talking to completely eludes me. And so how comforting it is to know that God knows and calls us by name. He knows our name, and we are his. Amen. We're his. We're his children. He loves us, and he cares about us. He knows our name. He knows our needs. He knows our circumstances. And he wants to be right in the middle of them to give us freedom from the pain and to restore our joy through the saving power of our resurrected Lord. The Bible's full of examples of God calling people by name. In Genesis, God called out to the newly fallen Adam and Eve in the garden. In Exodus, God called Moses by name, and he spoke out of a burning bush. In 1 Samuel, God called the young boy Samuel by name in the night, calling him to a future ministry. I love that story. Kids, if you're listening still and you haven't heard that story of God calling Samuel by name, ask your parents to find it for you there in 1 Samuel in the Old Testament. What a wonderful story. Samuel didn't understand at first, but when God's message took hold in Samuel's life, he became a powerful voice for the kingdom of God. He knows our names, and he will call out to us to set us to work for his kingdom. When Jesus called Mary's name, everything changed for her. She moved from sorrow and despair to joy and purpose. She would have loved to stay right there with Jesus in the garden, just holding on to him. But he had work for her to do. Jesus told Mary to go and tell the disciples the good news. Jesus was alive. He knew her name and had a mission for her, a mission that she must fulfill. Now, church history identifies Mary Magdalene as a sinful woman, an adulteress, a prostitute, but we know that she's so much more than that. I mean, think about it for a moment. Why do we dwell on the worst moments of people's lives? That's what Joshua preached on last week, didn't he? Dwelling on the worst moments in, in people's lives instead of the best. Thomas Aquinas calls Mary Magdalene an apostle to the apostles. What do you think about that? That's the way we should remember her, not all that stuff that went before. After all, when you come to Jesus, all the sins of your past are removed from you, and they don't have to have an impact on your life anymore. Why should Mary Magdalene be known as the sinful woman when she became the apostle to the apostles? Mm -hmm. The Lord called her to be an evangelist, and the very first people she told the good news to were Jesus' own disciples. 
She shared the good news. I have seen the Lord. The good news of God's love. The good news of the resurrection power. And in the same way, all Christians are invited to share the story of Jesus. So in a way, we are all evangelists. Evangelism is simply communicating this good news that the Savior of the world saves us and calls us into his kingdom. Evangelism is a word that puts fear in many hearts, though. Many Christians are afraid of it because they, they're afraid that they'll need to go and harass their, their immediate family and friends. That's not how it works. Has harassing really ever helped to change anybody's <laughs> mind of anything? Let's be honest. When all you do is bug them, that's not how it works. People just go, yeah, 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 all right, shut up. You know? <laughs> That's not what evangelism is. The truth is evangelism is simply bringing the good news of Jesus to everyone in our circle of influence by expanding our relationships so those who are unfamiliar can become familiar for the sake of the gospel. We can spread the good news of Jesus Christ. When we finally commit our lives to Christ and his mission for us, evangelism becomes an overflow of our life in Christ. It's not something that has to be forced because it just bubbles over. Sharing our faith should become the natural out, outgrowth, outgrowth of our circumstances. That's the way it's supposed to work. Just you sharing Jesus with the people that are around you. There's an old saying that says, this about the nature of evangelism. Evangelism is simply one beggar helping another beggar find bread. Oh, I love that one. Because it understands that every single one of us are on the same level. There's no one who is better or, or anyone who's worse. We're just people, and we are in the need of the grace of of God. Evangelism is simply helping one, one beggar helping another find bread. Mary Magdalene's encounter with the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ transformed her from one without hope to a bold and vibrant carrier of the good news of Jesus Christ. Be a Mary. Be a vibrant carrier of the good news of Jesus Christ right here and right now where you live. You know, we're dealing with something that can uh, be passed, a virus that can be passed from one person to another, and we're trying our hardest not to do that. But we do need to pass something else on that should be even more contagious, and that is the love and grace of God found only in Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are in a strange time. We are, are limited in our circle of influence right now. But there is no one listening to this today that doesn't have the ability to reach people for Jesus Christ by speaking to them, by texting them, by sharing on Facebook, by how about this one, this interesting one, send them a personal letter, send them a card of encouragement, or if you meet them in the grocery store with your masks on, <laughs> tell them about Jesus. And that way, the kingdom of God will continue to grow. I'd rather be a Mary, one who shares the gospel, because that is where true hope is found. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, we've come to a time of prayer in our service today. And uh, let me have my phone back now that it's been silenced here. <laughs> Let's see here what prayer requests we have. All right, so we have a, a prayer request for Lane Buck. We certainly want to be in prayer for her. She is uh, in the hospital with a brain aneurysm for Lane. That's an important one there. Let's see what else we have here. This is a long one here, so let me look at this real quick. I don't want to read it out loud until I know the whole thing here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, we have a, a man by the name of Linder who is in need of prayer. Um, he was at work yesterday, and uh, they were thinking that he had a mini heart attack or a stroke, but everything came back normal, praise be to God. They're not sure what happened. He's got a doctor's appointment on Thursday, and so prayers are greatly appreciated. Also prayers for all of the college students who have suddenly had to become online students who have final exams coming up in the next couple of weeks here. Uh, there's a lot of students, and I've talked to a few, and I've got a message from a college student right now, that's who this is from, who is really struggling with this online work. Uh, it's nothing like being in the classroom. Those who think, oh, that's a great deal, you get to stay home in your jammies and do your college work, it's no fun, to be honest. I, a few years ago, I took a continuing education class online, worst experience I've ever had. Now, the teacher was great, and the classmates were great, but I never saw them. And all that online stuff's really difficult for learning. So pray for our college students who have finals coming. Pray for all of our kids. I spoke to a family this week. Their kids are doing very well with the homework being sent home to them. Uh, so I appreciate all the teachers who are putting together those homework packs. Those are so important. Some of you are able to do it online. Some are able to do it only by paper. And you're doing a wonderful job. I've talked to a couple different families, and they're grateful. Some families are struggling to get the kids to do it at home. There's so much else fun out there to do. So uh, just really be praying for all of the students, all the teachers, and uh, be in prayer for all those who are struggling difficult this time. for the elementary teachers who are not used to having to do things online. Yes, very difficult and for the elementary. And to get kids to pay attention through a computer is a challenge. Yeah, definitely, because, you know, if Fortnite was running, they'd have it, but uh, their subjects aren't Fortnite. Although, if you had a class in that, I bet they'd all get an A. That might work. All right, other prayer requests. Any others come in? Um, not one that's in there, but there was something mentioned with one of my churches. There was a church member that apparently had a stroke over the weekend. Mm. I don't remember who, <clears> but there was a member with a stroke. And we're at Broughton or Tate's Chapel Tate's Churches Chapel. who had a stroke, all right? That was Mike Schultz, by the way, my son-in-law. Uh, he is a ministry intern with Broughton and Tate's Chapel, the United Methodist Churches, and he hasn't been able to do any of his internship for the last few weeks, so... Uh, we appreciate that as he's here with us, we want to pray for that person who had a stroke. Any others that you guys know of? I'm sure there are others who need prayer today. We want to lift them up, continue to pray for all of those who go to work every day in order to keep things running for us, continue to pray for our medical uh, staff. That's so important. We want them to be protected. I, I've seen uh, where we've lost a few doctors in the nation due to this now and some nurses and so uh, we really need to be in prayer. We need to be in prayer that they will find the answer very quickly. Most of you who are watching this today know that we have been extended on our stay-at-home order here in the state of Illinois until the end of May. And so we're going to be coming to you this way for some time now. And uh, I just pray that it's a blessing to you. I want to be in prayer for all those who have lost their jobs. There are some who have received unemployment, and that's a real blessing. There are others who I have talked to who have not been able to receive unemployment because they were uh, self-employed contractors for companies. So we need to be in prayer for them, especially because they have no income right now. We need to be in prayer for the small business owners. Guess what? They're unpaid right now, too. And so we need to be in prayer for all of these that need God to step in and get this thing to end really quickly. As well as those who are dealing with added depression and yes. anxiety and even their addictions. It's harder when you're isolated. It is much harder when you're isolated. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Master and our God, we thank you and praise you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to worship together Lord, for those gathered and for those who are in their homes today watching over Facebook or YouTube, we are thankful, Father, that we are able to come together, that you have enabled this technology. And Father, we just ask that it would continue to be used for your purposes. We pray especially for those who are dealing with addiction. We ask, Lord, that you would free them of their addictions, that you would set them free. This is a much more difficult time for them, as many are furloughed from work or going through extra stress because their work has been made harder. 
We pray, Lord God, that you would be with them and care for them and help them, Lord, to stay strong in the midst of a very difficult time. We pray for those who are dealing with anxiety over this. Lord, we just pray that you would relieve them of that anxiety and give them peace in their hearts. For those who are dealing with depression, we ask, Father, that you would lift them up out of that miry clay and help them to be strong and help them to know joy in the midst of all of the troubles going on. We pray for all those who are dealing with online classes right now. For those students that never intended to be online students, but now they are, Lord, we just pray that you'd be with them, give them encouragement, help them to stay focused on the work that they need to do. We pray for the college students whose final exams are coming very soon. We pray for the high school students, especially the seniors, Lord, who their year has been shortened, yet they still have work to do. We pray for the junior high students. We pray, Father, that you would really help them to stay focused. We know it's hard at that age to stay focused, but Lord, we just ask that you'd encourage them right now in Jesus' name. We pray for the elementary students. We ask, Lord, that you would give them encouragement and, Lord, just help them to understand all that is being taught to them. We pray for the parents. Uh, Lord, we've talked to some, who, uh, some parents who were never intending to be teachers who are now having to teach stuff they've never seen before. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would give them clarity as they try to help their kids understand the lessons. Also, Lord, bring peace to homes that are struggling from that 24-hour uh, togetherness that they're just not used to. We pray for our medical professionals, Lord. We just pray that you would care for them right now in Jesus' name. For those who have died, Lord, we pray for their families, that you would give them strength and peace, wrap them in the arms of your love during this time. Lord, for those who are sick, we ask that you bring healing to them. For those medical professionals and the support staff in the hospitals who uh, are dealing with this virus, we just pray, Lord, that you would keep them safe. Lord, we pray for all of the medical staff and the support workers who have been furloughed during this time in our smaller hospitals because they don't have much work. Lord, we just pray that you would provide for them. We pray that you'd give the scientists good understanding of this disease so that they can find a vaccine very, very quickly. Be with our leaders, Lord, and give them wisdom in this time that they may know the right answers how they are to do what they need to do. We pray for this one who has possibly had a stroke. We ask for your healing touch upon them. We lift up Linder to you. We ask for your care upon him and, and your healing touch. We lift up Lane to you, Lord. We ask that uh, this brain aneurysm would go away, that, Lord, the doctors would be able to help her with this. And, and Lord, we just ask that you would bring healing completely to her. Be with her family, Lord, and care for them. And with all the families who are away from their loved ones who are in hospitals. We lift up Mary to you, and we just ask for your healing touch upon her and for her husband, Delton, as he deals with this loss of his wife being away from him. Lord, they've been together for over 60 years, and this is difficult as his wife's in the hospital in St. Louis, and he's here at home. Lord, would you comfort him? Would you give him wisdom? Would you give him encouragement in the name of Jesus? Lord, we thank you that she's starting to show some, some progress here. Father, would you continue to work the progress in Mary? We thank you that you are doing that. Bring her to rehab quickly and then home. Lord, we pray for all of our brothers and sisters in Christ who are worshiping from home today. May you give them wisdom, may you give them strength, and may you encourage them in their walk with you. Lord God, we pray for our military men and women, wherever they are. We ask, Lord, that you protect them and that, Lord, you would use them in ways that, that help with this situation. We pray especially for those who are in harm's way right now. We ask that you'd be with them and keep them safe. Lord God, we pray for the church. We pray for all of the churches who are trying to keep going under these really difficult circumstances. We lift up our bishop, Bishop Beard, to you right now in Jesus' name. We ask that you give him strength and wisdom as he leads our United Methodist Conference here in Illinois. And Lord, that you'd be with our superintendent to stand. Lord, just give him strength as he leads our district here. Father, help him to have wisdom in his work. 
Lord, there's just so much more that we can lift up for, for to you, so much more that needs to be said. But Father, we thank you that you know the needs even before we speak them. And so we ask you, Lord, that we might see the answer to our prayers and that, Lord, you might be glorified. For it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. All right. Well, if you have any other prayer requests you didn't get to us during this time, if you want to send those to us, we will be praying for them throughout the week. Another announcement you didn't think about was if you want communion next week, yes, um, let us know how many in your family, and uh, we'll make sure that you can get that if we can possibly get it to you. All right. If you would like to receive communion, uh, we are right now trying to secure some communion elements that can be delivered to your homes. Uh, if you would like those, then I ask that you uh, you get the you get a message to us so we know how many to deliver to you. We're hoping to have communion next Sunday morning. Uh, if we can't get them by then, then it'll be the next week. But we're going to try to get our communion elements for you and delivered to you. So please do let us know if you would like to receive. And if you can help deliver. Yes, and if you can help deliver. Uh, if you are going to deliver, you will be wearing masks. And you will be uh, going just up to the door. You don't need to even see the people. You just knock and you leave it for them. And so we could really use your help with that as well. All right, we're going to close our service this morning. It's number 569 in the United Methodist Hymnal. We have a story to tell to the nations. We have a story to tell to the nations that shall turn their hearts to the right. A story of truth and mercy, a story of peace and light, a story of peace and light. For the darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright. When Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. We've a song to be sung to the nations that shall lift their hearts to the Lord. A song that shall conquer evil and shatter the spear and sword and shatter the spear and sword. For the darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. We've a message to give to the nations, that the Lord who reigneth above, have sent us a son to save us and show us that God is love and show us that God is love for the darkness shall turn to dawning and the dawning to noonday bright and Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. We've a Savior to show to the nations, who the path of sorrow have trod, that all of the world's great peoples might come to the truth of God, might come to the truth of God. For the darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright, and Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. Well, thank you for joining us in worship today, and I hope that you will go and find our devotions throughout the week. We post one every single day on our Sunfield and Greenwood Facebooks, and then a little bit later on YouTube. So I'm going to encourage you to go to those and watch those, and that they will be an encouragement to you during this time away. 
We ask that the Lord will bless you today and give you the strength that you need for the living of this day. Let's pray. Father, we just ask that as we go from this time of worship, that we will know your peace in our hearts, that you will use us to share your message to all that we encounter this week. And Lord, that you will keep us safe in the midst of it all. May your joy be made full and complete in us, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let us go in peace and joy from this time of worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the Lord bless your day.